Welcome to the How to Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today I am so excited to have the esteemed Dr. Sarai Stancic. How are you? Very good. Thank you, Dr. Marvis. <laughs> it's so great to be with you today. I know it's been hard to get to this point, but we are here. You are one busy lady. That's all I can say. So <laughs> I thought I was busy, but you're super busy. So, well, you have such an incredible story and an I don't know even where to begin, but I love to hear stories of, because I really want to connect the personal side of medicine for patients or for people who are listening to the doctors. So we all, well, most of us have a story of why we went into medicine. Can you give us a little bit of idea of why you went into medicine and infectious disease was your original specialty? Yeah. yeah. So why did I go into medicine? For me, it was like in my genes, genetically embedded. Um, I always knew I wanted to be a physician. My mom says I used to find anything and wrap it around my neck and pretend it was a stethoscope when I was two or three. So that was a no brainer. Um, infectious diseases was a little bit different. So uh, getting into medical school was a dream come true. Um, I went to medical school in the late 80s, early 90s, and that period was coincident with the height of the HIV epidemic. And I went to school in Newark, New Jersey. So you uh, might imagine what I witnessed. Um, and I really wanted to be part of that solution. So after finishing my uh, chief resident year in internal medicine, I went on to do a subspecialty in infectious diseases to really address the HIV epidemic um, that we were facing at the time. Wow. So now tell us, where did you go to medical school? In Newark, New Jersey, uh, it used to be called UMDNJ, but now it's Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. Oh, very nice. Okay, so that, that's just a little background because now you practice full-time lifestyle medicine, but there's a story between here and there. So tell us your story of MS, multiple sclerosis. When did you start becoming ill? So uh, back in October 11th, 1995, at the time, I was a third year medical resident, and uh, during, in the midst of a very busy call, I was awakened uh, to find I couldn't feel my lower extremities. So I was emergently brought to the ER, and an MRI confirmed a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis with multiple lesions in both my brain and spinal cord. And so everything happened really overnight. I, was, I came in that, that morning feeling well and uh, no medical history and you know just turned 28 years old and then all of a sudden you know everything the floor fell out from under me and um it was an incredibly frightening moment in my life so what happened after that so here you are in the er you were fine this morning it's that one moment right that everything changes and shifts and yeah what was was going on in your mind i mean i can't even fathom like literally the rug has been pulled out from your entire life yeah, just pure fear, not really knowing what was happening. Um, like I said, I mean, I was running around uh, the day before I, I, I had gone for a, a long run. During the call, I was fine and literally went to bed to take a, a nap at two o'clock in the morning. And I think I was paged like a half an hour later. It's really amazing mm -hmm. how quickly it happened. Um, you know, but in retrospect, when I look back after the diagnosis, there were certainly things that were happening, like, for example, pins and needles I would experience. And I thought it was just because I was wearing really high heels or, um, you know, during an exam in medical school, I would have to get up to go to the bathroom often. So I would have the, the uh, they thought I was cheating, you know, why is she going to the bathroom so much? She must have the answer somewhere. Um, it was my bladder was failing and I, I just, you know, I hadn't pieced all the, uh, and you're, you know, you're, you're in the left lane when you're a medical resident, you're on call, there's so much going on, you have board exams, you have, you know, your fellowship you're applying for, there's a million things going on in your life. And so you don't stop to think we're not very good at taking care of ourselves physicians um, and medical students. We are, um, we work too hard. We don't get enough sleep. We eat poorly. And you, and I'm sure that all of those variables played a role in the evolution of the disease um, and for the, you know, the example in, in my life. Um, but yeah, I mean, being in that emergency room, um, it was pure fear, not knowing what was happening, you know, uh, and, and when I finally heard the diagnosis, it was as if someone had, you know, punched me where in, in the stomach, it was just okay. very, again, as a student and I mean, as a resident, um, seeing the typical MS patient in the clinic, I knew what that entailed. Right, absolutely. 
So what was the first step? What was the next steps that you did? What did you do? Were you in the hospital for a while? Did you get out of the ER, go home? And what happened? No, no, they immediately admitted me. Uh, and I was started on IV steroids. I had um, uh, multiple lesions and, and one big enhancing lesion. So um, they, I started on IV solumedrol and I was treated uh, uh, for five days in the hospital. And then physical therapy was started to get me walking again. And then medicines were started for now my terrible bladder that um, was just a hot mess. And, and uh, I had a lot of pain, very bad uh, neuropathic pain. So medicines to treat that. And, and then, you know, the walker and the crutches and the cane to get me walking again. And then shortly after that, after that hospitalization, um, I was asked to come back because then the plan was to start a disease modifying therapy. And back then there was only one drug approved by, by the FDA and that was drug, um, an interferon drug. God bless you. <laughs> yeah. And Go ahead. so then the you know my doctors advised me that i needed to start this medicine to slow the progression of the disease mm -hmm. and um, they talked about uh, a future that wasn't very bright you know a wheelchair and potentially a nursing home setting and i, got, I suddenly got very very scared and uh, of course uh, i was going to follow whatever they advised me to do to prevent that from happening wow so did you have to take a leave of absence from your residency i'm assuming I did. I took a, a couple of weeks, not not very long. I, I returned, you know, using a cane. It took me. I think, I think uh, from that initial exacerbation, it probably took me six to eight weeks to get to to be able to walk without it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I took a couple of weeks, but went back to work even with the cane. Wow. Okay, that's incredible. So then you went on going through residency, still the stresses of that. You're sick. You're being on medications that are probably making you not feel well. Yeah. When did you start searching for alternative solutions or how was that presented to you? Yeah, so um, so the, the, the years that followed were pretty rocky. At some point, um, I, I would say every three to six months, I would have an exacerbation uh, and, and that would be through hospitalization or IV steroids. And, but every time I had an event, I started to lose a little bit more and more neurological function. And so I would say by the time, you know, eight years, into the disease, I was largely, at that point, I, I pretty much didn't feel confident leaving the house without at least the cane or something in the car to make sure. And I was very vain, you know, I didn't want to use the cane or the crutch, so I tried to do everything I can, even fashion non-canes uh, into something that I could use. So, because you know what, it, a lot of it for me was, I hated to be asked the question because you don't expect to see a young woman with a, a cane or a crutch, it just, you know, the immediate, most people will ask you, well, what happened? Did you have some kind of athletic injury? And you don't want to have to explain that. And particularly as a, as a physician, patients would come in to see me. And if I was using a cane or a crutch on that day, then it would become about me. You know, Dr. Stancic, what's going on? Did you hurt yourself? Can you tell, and you know, and then it was like, and if you do tell them you have MS, then, then it's like that look of pity. I really feel bad and you know what I mean it was just like exhausting having to explain it away right. so it wasn't really vanity it was just I didn't want to have to deal with what came next because right. it was always that look like I feel sorry for you and I hate that look wow so you've actually had the disease for eight long years prior to change so yeah, yeah what so, happened yeah so I this journal throwaway journal somehow made it to my desk and on the cover I saw the words multiple sclerosis and blueberries and I said what does what in the world can blueberries have to do with MS and um, of course I, I immediately dropped everything and read the article and it was not not a scientifically sound uh, study that you and I would be pleased with as you know from, sci from a scientific objective perspective. And it wasn't that I thought eating blueberries was going to be the solution to my MS, but it was that study that for the first time, um, you know, in thinking about this, uh, a much more important question surfaced from reading that study. And that was for the first time in my life, oh my goodness, here I am a physician, I'm an attending physician, chief of infectious diseases at the Hudson Valley VA in New York. And for the first time I, I considered this question, could there be a connection between diet and disease? <laughs> it's like, it's like the light bulb goes off, doesn't it? Yes. 
Yes, it does. And that, and, and, and that, that's crazy that we are doctors and we don't, this isn't the most important question. The most important topic that is addressed throughout the, the experience of medical education, but that's what we're, that's another topic we're hopefully going to talk about today that I'm, <sighs> I want to ensure that we change this moving forward. But so yeah, that little article. And then of course I turned to the literature looking for that answer. Could these things be connected? And of course, uh, there was ample evidence in literature that I was overwhelmed with that helped me to understand that, oh my goodness, yes, here's the key. And now, how do I begin to implement changes in my own life? And there was, you know, there was no help out there. There were no, there, there were no physicians that I could turn to for advice on this. This was solely a journey I was going to take on my own and um, uncover the data and then implement um, an approach that would really turn the course of my life in a very positive direction. What year was this? 2003. Oh, wow. So it's early. So this is before folks over knives and oh, yeah, there all was these no, things. There was, no, no, no. Oh, wow. 2003. And um, so, so, yeah, there, there was very little information out there. So who, what did you find to, to lead you in the right direction? Like, how did you discover these answers and, and get you down the path that you are today? Yeah, so... I think the turning point for me was Swank. Roy Swank was an American physician, was very interested. He's actually um, practiced in Portland, Oregon. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and um, Dr. Swank wrote an article in 1952, published in New England Journal of Medicine, that discussed uh, this connection between saturated fat and multiple sclerosis. At least he hypothesized this based on the work he had done, looking at pockets of high incidence of MS in in Norway, which was a, is a country that has very high um, rates of MS. And he describes that the folks that are living in the inner farming community were eating primarily dairy, butter, fat, lots of animal sources of food had the highest rates of MS when he compared it to those that were living on the coast, again, still in Norway, but they were eating primarily fish and vegetation. And it was that that uh, he then led to the conclusion that, that it was saturated fat that was somehow playing a role in the development of MS. And mm -hmm. so that was the first article that, that really um, resonated with me. And then I just continued to look beyond Swank's work and really understand not only in my own personal, um, my, for my own personal, personal uh, experience with MS, but also in helping me to understand how nutrition was playing a role in my patients in my diabetic patients and in, uh, in clinical practice, all the diseases that I was seeing, the status post-stroke patient in the critical care unit with, a, with a pneumonia or the, the demented patient in the nursing home that I was being asked to see with the um, cystitis or the, or the urinary tract infection, that how all of these variables were playing a role in the development of these diseases. So I started to piece this all together and became deeply passionate about not only changing um, my lifestyle, but also advising um, my patients to similarly do the same. Wow. So you changed your, you, were, you started changing your diet accordingly. And by the way, my aunt died at 44 of MS. And so it's a very near and dear subject. So I, and I've, I look back and she grew up and she hated vegetables. She grew up eating meat and cheese and dairy, some potatoes. That was her token vegetable. And she became very ill at 40 and died four years later. And um, so it's very concerning, but I can see what you're describing, the high saturated fat diet and stuff. So you changed your diet and what was your, what was your, what was your morph? What was your, your transformation? How did that occur? Yeah. So <clears throat> I, I, once I had, and by the way, I didn't, uh, I really thought this through very, very carefully. It wasn't something that I uh, decided overnight. I decided to discontinue. At that point I was like on 10 to 12 medicines. And so uh, I decided I was going to taper myself off the medicine. I did this, and again, I don't advise anyone to do this. I did this on my own because I just wasn't getting support from, from or garnering support from my physicians. They, they thought what I was doing was irresponsible. But again, the, the lifestyle that I was leading at that point, I mean, I, I was wearing a diaper at times. Uh, I couldn't, I was deeply depressed. I was, uh, the steroids were leading to weight gain. I, I was just a really unhappy young woman. And I, I thought to myself, if, if I can only have 
a few years of you know good quality of life it's worth it to me as compared to what i was experiencing so i decided that i was going to taper off of all of that and i was going to adopt a whole food plant-based diet and the reason i adopted a whole food plant-based diet was not because it was the fad diet of the day or because it was popular or it was hashtag trending it was the reason i adopted a diet rich in fruits vegetables whole grains legumes nuts and seeds was because the overwhelming body of scientific literature pointed to a diet rich in those foods to be the ideal diet for optimal health. Um, and it's not an MS diet. It's not a diabetes diet. It's not a cancer diet. It's a, it's a diet that we should all be engaging in to optimize our health. And so I did that. Uh, I started to exercise. I hadn't exercised in years because back in the 1990s, I was told that exercise would worsen my disease, would exacerbate my disease. So I started slowly on a stationary bike and I built stamina over time. Uh, I began coming off of Ambien was one of the hardest things I ever experienced. They say it's not an addictive drug, it's addictive. Highly I, addictive. I was, well, this is what they gave me when I told them wow. I couldn't sleep, you know, they, just another prescription for Ambien. And that was really hard coming off that, creating, mm -hmm. a, you know, really effective, healthy sleep hygiene in my environment and coming off of that terrible medicine. And um, all of these things happened over several months to a couple of years. And I regained control of my life. I mean, I started to feel well. I started to feel my legs. I started to um, uh, con consider uh, doing something like running. And um, in, I, get, I think in 2006, 2007, I felt well enough that I could start to do that. And um, fast forward 2010, I ran a marathon, which was uh, an extraordinary accomplishment for me, something that I could, you know, never imagine was feasible or possible. It came to fruition simply because I tended to my lifestyle and I changed the course of my disease. Mm. So that story, and it was painful. Um, I've been through a lot uh, over the past 20, it's been 23 years since my diagnosis almost. Um, and those, those battle scars, you know, um, I've learned a lot and I wanna share and I wanna empower others to understand that we can all do this. There's no magic here. Um, and there's a much easier way. I mean, I had to, I, like I said, I didn't have the support and understanding um, or guidance from, from a healthcare professional. And so for me, it's about making sure that other patients moving forward understand this. And, and that's not to say that medicines, by the way, are not, an important part of healthcare. Certainly, they play an important role. I mean, I'm an infectious disease physician. Where would we be without properly uh, used antibiotics? And look at uh, what we've done with HIV medicines from the point where I was. Where I mean, I was when I was a medical resident. In one night, we would admit a toxoplasmosis case, a cryptococcal meningitis, a pneumocystis in one night, and we would um, be called. Uh, uh, to to a bedside and, and, and lose two or three patients in one night. So mm. we've come a long way and medicines are an important part of that. But we need to, as healthcare professionals as, and as physicians, speak to the importance of our, our lifestyle choices and how by optimizing them, we can, we can certainly prevent so much of the diseases that we see today in clinical practice. Absolutely. So tell me what was the progression of your healing so you started the the diet you started seeing change so what were the first things that you started seeing improving how long did it take you to get off the medications what was that timeline yeah so the the coming off of all the medications i would say it took about six months um and then there were there were times i actually had an exacerbation in that first year and immediately um i would my physician said, you know, you, you've done this to yourself. And it was, a, it was terrible. I mean, I, it, and I started to question what I was doing. Um, but I, I, I don't know, by the grace of God, something pushed me. Maybe my, I haven't, by the way, an amazing husband who's been with me throughout all of this time. And he, and he, he knew that there were, there were signs that things were, there were small things. Like, for example, I could stay up past the evening news or um, I had a little bit more optimism. There were, there were things that I just felt better. Um, there were signs that things were going in the right direction. But as far as the MS was concerned, um, I wasn't sure where it was going to take me, but it was good to be off the antidepressant. It was good to be off the sleep agent. 
it just felt good not to have a pillbox, you know? Mm -hmm. 32 years old and you're walking around with a pillbox and feeling like, oh my God, I can't go somewhere without it. Um, that was really just depressing to say the least. I think by, by, the, by the time two years, in two, by 2005, I felt confident that things were really getting better. Um, <clears throat> the exacerbations now, instead of every three to six months, if I had one, it would be every you know, six months to a year. And they were seemingly um, more mild, not, not as um, profound as the previous ones. Um, in 2005, I think uh, uh, there's a slide that I have when I speak. It's a picture of my husband and I at a wedding that we attended. That was um, in 2005. And, and the reason I have that photograph, and it means actually, I think it's somewhere on the, uh, it's actually up on behind me. Uh -huh. It means a lot to me because that day I, d I, had, I did two things I hadn't done in a long time. I wore heels and I, I danced with my husband. I love, you know, I'm Cuban, so I love to dance. And um, it was something that I really couldn't do very well or, you know, um, so it's just small things that you take for granted, you know, when things are uh, that, that suddenly when you're, when you, ha when you regain that capability, it feels like you just won lotto, you know, it just feels amazing. Wow. So how about the imaging of the lesions? Have this, that improved? Yes. So, um, it, you know, the first time I had the MRI, it was such a traumatic experience for me. I was in there for like two and a half hours. And uh, I was in a lot of pain during that time. And uh, I think I have a little bit of PTSD. I, I mean, I, I cared for veterans for many years. And, and um, when they described their, the, what PTSD, I think I have some of those symptoms where even the sound of the MRI machine sort of brings me back and I get a little short of, you know, it's really sort of scary. But uh, I did have an MRI done recently. The director uh, for Code Blue asked if I would do it for the film. Uh, mm -hmm. I hadn't done one in many years, so I just had an MRI done, and uh, we're going to sh share it in the film, but uh, I have uh, no, no lesions. Wow. So, yeah. so, that is so incredible. So this is incredible. We'll get to Code Blue in a second, but yeah. what do people who knew you, your doctors, I mean, they were there telling you you're going to hurt yourself, don't do this, why are you doing this? what are your colleagues, what did they say when they saw this progression over a course of years that to you now, I mean, wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I think everyone's just really excited and, and, and happy for me. Um, I, even my closest friends who love me were very concerned when I decided to do this. Uh, I mean, I, 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 was, I was a little bit scared as well, but I, but I think that, and I understood their perspective, even my husband's a physician and he was very concerned of, of the decision that I made to come off the medicine was willing to support me, but was very um, hesitant. Uh, but no one could really, I, no one could really step into my shoes. I was the one that was living day in and day out with the experience that I um, was having, and to me, it was intolerable. I, um, I just didn't want to live that way anymore. It, it, it was just um, too difficult. Everything seemed so hard to do. Something really that again, you take for granted, it, it felt insurmountable. So um, I can tell you quickly, it, um, this past December, I, I went to see my first MS doctor. I hadn't seen him in a long time. Um, I didn't even know if he was still in practice because he was, he was older then. <laughs> um, so I did, I did reach out to him and, and ask if we could meet. And, he, and I brought the cameras with me. Um, I brought the director, but he refused to, to be videoed, um, to be uh, filmed. But he was, very, I can tell you this, he was very happy to see me. He was thrilled to see that I was walking and, and looking well. And the first question he asked me was, what medicine are you on? And when I said, I'm not on any medicines, he immediately sort of took a step back and was no longer... He, you know, so I told him that it was, it was my lifestyle and this really great diet. And, and as soon as I said that, he sort of didn't, it didn't resonate with him. And he was, I think, uncomfortable. Mm. But I understand the world that he comes from. He's a good man. And, but he just, he doesn't get this. And I, and I, so he, the immediate thing he said to me is, you, you know, you, you probably would have been fine had you done anything because you probably just have benign MS and, 
And I'm thought, I thought to myself, benign, do you remember what I was like? But you know, it's funny, they're willing, if I was, if I was on a medicine, then we're more than happy to, to claim that it was the medicine. But if, right. that's, that's the mindset that regrettably so many physicians have. It is. That's the frustrating part when you discount the body's ability to heal itself when it's given the proper nutrition, the, the proper lifestyle interventions, exercise, rest, stress mm -hmm. reduction, that we don't understand that is actually our most powerful weapon against illness. Man-made medicines are fantastic. They save lives, but they're not the answer that a whole food plant-based diet can be. You know, I tell people, I was like, you know, so you have a disease process. If anything, we may not be able to reverse it, but we can make you in the most optimal health we can. And then we can use maybe less medications, or maybe we will be very fortunate and have complete reversal of the symptoms. So, and it, but it is colleagues become, some are very open to it. I think, I think those who don't, for me, it's like, I'm always open. I know I don't have all the answers and I think it was be, yeah, I think it'd be very arrogant of me to think that I did. Um, so I'm always open to listening and seeing the science. I mean, it was a radical change in a patient for me that like, what was that? That's really cool. And then I just started diving into it. And within two weeks, changed my entire family overnight. And it we haven't looked back in six years, but it's like, it is a bit frustrating when people become almost um, agitated that you would even speak of something like that. They do um, get agitated. Often. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not sure why that is. And I think that's one of the questions I tried to answer in Club Blue. Yeah. Um, because uh, I, it almost feels like we as physicians and healthcare professionals might feel a little threatened that it could be something. Uh, I mean, we invest so much time and money and energy into uh, our medical degrees and understand what are we taught in medical school? We're not taught this. Um, what you just said um, is not a lesson that is described in, in, to us in medical school. We're taught, you know, make a diagnosis. We're really good as diagnosticians. We can make the diagnosis. And then what is the, um, the therapeutic plan? It always includes either a pharmaceutical um, intervention or a surgical intervention. That's what we do. That's what we're taught. Um, and it's, extraordinary in, in light of all the evidence that we have that points to the power of lifestyle as medicine that it is not the most important message that we relay to our students mm -hmm. and to our doctors in training right it yeah because i i asked that same question too or i'll ask patients who you know were really hesitant or resistant and then something flipped for them they're like oh well, let me do this diet and then they get better. I'm like, well, what is it that right. makes that transition to you? What, but everyone's a little bit differently, right? You know, it was, for example, I had a diabetic patient in Colorado, <sighs> worked on this woman for a year, go to the whole food plant. They said, yeah, Dr. Marvis, I know she would dabble. But then there was one time I, uh, there was a study, you know, about the um, smoking and uh, processed meats and different things that I was talking about with diabetics and blah, blah, blah. And there was something about smoking. She hated smokers, like smoking. Like she just, she goes, really? I'm doing exactly like, really? That's to my body and inflammation and blah, blah, blah. I can't remember the exact connotation of the, or the discussion, but she just, <laughs> she was off her insulin within months. And I was just like, completely turned her life around. I'm just like, yeah. how is this? What? She goes, you just mentioned the right thing at the right time. So that's why I tell people, don't give up. You know, you don't want to be right it's obnoxious i mean it's it's amazing it you never know what you how somebody's going to get affected somebody's going to hear me i've i've had um people write me an email and say you know i heard you speak uh on june 5th 2015 you were at this place and this and you talked about and i heard you and i changed my life I, it changed my life i i adopted a whole plant-based diet i mean I, you know it just you never know right but, that's why we have to uh, speak to this. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to meet with you today. And maybe you know, somebody will hear this podcast, somebody with MS or somebody with diabetes or somebody who is going to develop breast cancer in 10 years if she doesn't change her ways today. Right. We're going to reach somebody and we're going to change the course of their life. And that's what this is. This is why we went to medical school. We want to serve our community and have 
Um, yeah. Everyone gracefully and without that suffering at the end of, the, of their lives. What's unfortunate is that we have to find avenues outside of our general medical practice to do this message and this work. So you right. had to change into lifestyle medicine and practitioner. I did a lot of more lifestyle medicine with my general family practice doing the podcast outside of this, doing the journal that we're working on, you're building your own documentary about, you know, your experience. I mean, <laughs> it would just make it be, there should be news broadcasts every single day of these amazing stories, the research that's going on. Um, and that I think is what is really fueled my passion. Like we have to get this message out. And I think we're in a really unique time to be able to do that. There's a trend towards plant-based diets. A lot of people are beginning to waking up to that. You know, it's so easy on the internet to share that information, but you're exactly right. Well, thank you for sharing. I mean, you could have easily just got better and went about your life. I mean. Yeah, but I, I, it's such a, it almost felt like a secret I had to tell. <laughs> right? It is, it is. It feels, but this one I tell people, like you can reverse your diabetes. Like this is really a disease of choice. And they're like, really? I was like, Ugh. I said, I always tell, this is one of my favorite things, especially with type two diabetes, because it's so prevalent in our society. I was like, I want you to ask your doctor what causes diabetes. And then they're going to tell you this, insulin resistance. Then I said, then I want you to ask them what causes insulin resistance on the cellular level and to draw it out for you. And if they can, great. This is someone you should be listening to because they should be on top of the science and be able to, but most of them can't. They're like, I don't know what causes the insulin resistance. Go eat a paleo diet. You know, let's make that worse. So they don't understand the basics of this, of this research has been out there for a while about lipotoxicity. And so the, when I explain that to the patient, it's like, ah, oh. I said, empower yourself with knowledge. Ask the doctors. If your doctor won't help you, find another doctor, you know, someone who's willing to listen. So yeah, I know I get really excited too because my daughter is a medical student. Her fiance is a medical student. They're both plant-based. I'm yeah. very excited to see where so they go. Have, so this next generation is the key. So we have two doctors that you just, your daughter and <laughs> son-in-law to be. To be so, soon. But, but that's happening. It's spreading all over. And mm -hmm. uh, I can't wait to, to uh, show you some of my wonderful students that, that, that we're going to be featuring in Code Blue. Yeah. So, so tell us about the Code Blue. Like how did this come about? I mean, to set out your own documentary, I mean, <sighs> Yeah, it's funny how you know the the path the path just lights up before you and it takes you oh. where you want to go somehow, right? Oh, I know. It's it for me. I have a strong faith that God just makes things happen. Oh, so. I'm with you on that, sister. Sure. <laughs> okay, good. And I, you know, uh, so when I decided to to do this, open this practice, of course, everyone thought I was crazy. Uh, you're going to give up your practice and in infectious diseases and hepatitis where you're doing important research and you're going to give that all up and you're going to tell patients to eat plants you're crazy <laughs> and you'll go bankrupt and and i oh gosh i knew all those things but it it, it felt like i was compelled to do it you know you know what i mean i could oh, not, not do it, it i know this crazy. compulsion oh yes. yeah <laughs> <laughs> some people might call madness um it's all right I, yeah i was willing to take um the risk because it was that important to me. Uh, so I, I did it and, and, um, and it's funny how medical student, this young man, uh, one of the medical students that's in the film saw Batista came to visit me and, and uh, was starting medical school and wanted, uh, had read about my work and about lifestyle medicine and came to see me telling me, I'm going to medical school with the intention of being a lifestyle medicine physician. I wanna do what you do. And that to me was just like, Wow. Uh, he was the key to really help me understand that this next generation sees the world differently mm -hmm. and they get it. They're really, really smart. And um, he started a, and I'm, I mentor the group. It's a lifestyle medicine interest group at our medical school. And what we're trying to do is bring that terminology and that understanding and education to medical students when they're first and second years mm -hmm. so that they can incorporate it into their clinical years. And then um, all of this is going on simultaneously. My practice is growing. And um, I start getting a lot of patients who are also happen to be doctors. And it happened because we had a patient in common at some point, a diabetic or an obese patient that they would see. And, and when the patient returns to see them and follow up, they've lost the weight, they're off the metformin, they're off the Lipitor. And the doctor calls me and says, what are you doing? And that's when we we talk about lifestyle medicine. I send them the literature to support what I do because everything we talk about is evidence-based. This is not 
Sarai Stancic's opinion. It is, the, it is based on the literature. And once the doctors understand that this is not hokey pokey, you know, um, silly stuff, that this right. is scientific medicine and that yes, we use um, mainstream clinical, we, I use medicines and of course do all the things that I would do in clinical practice 20 years ago, but this is just um, highlighting lifestyle. Once they get that, they say to me, you know what, I'm, oh, I'm carrying too much weight, my blood pressure's up, I have very bad sleep hygiene, I need to, to come see you to help me get better. And so that to me is amazing because when I have a patient who's also a doctor or a nurse or you know anybody, in the, helping them get healthy helps in turn help their patient population. Mm -hmm. and that, that's the home run. And that, that's when I started to piece it together that it's not, it's beyond this small practice that, um, this passion and initiative I have is, is much bigger than this. I, and I need to reach as many people as possible. And that's really how Code Blue came to be because, you know, I write articles, I give lectures, I do podcast interviews. Those are all very, very important. But I thought, what other medium can we utilize to spread the word? And, um, and I had so many patients come to me and say, that film, Forks Over Knives, changed my life. And I was like, what is that film? <laughs> and then I, I watched the film and I'm like, okay. I get it. This is just another really great um, medium. And mm -hmm. so uh, I partnered with this wonderful woman. Her name is Marcia Machado. She's a filmmaker. And um, we decided we were going to make a, a film that was going to shed light on this lapse in medical education and, um, and propose a solution to that problem by assuring that um, those that are create academic, you know, the um, curriculum, those in academia that create curricula in medical schools, that they get this and that they incorporate this very all important message into the curricula of every experience for every medical student across our country. Forget across our country, globally, mm -hmm. that every physician on planet earth can speak to this universally and ubiquitously, that we're all on the same page so we don't confuse patients. This is not a complicated uh, lesson. We complicated by, you know, everybody has a different book out. Here's an MS book and here's a diabetes book and, you know, this diet. And we give, you know, funky names to different diets and we confuse the public. Let's stop this nonsense and let's just speak the truth. Let's uh, make it very clear to patients. We need to um, get the word out because it saves lives. Absolutely. So, <laughs> exactly right. There's so much in that little bit that you just said. So tell me what is the, the premise of the film is your story, right? And you're giving that solution. And then where you are in this production of the film, what is going on there? So the premise of the story, so the filmmaker came to me, she was interested in my story, but it's really not about me. You know, I, I told, I told but, her. But Sarai, it is about you because you are the one who was, you know, I consider things that happen in your life as a gift, that gift that you took and now you are great, but it is, you, you need to give yourself credit for that and you should because you're amazing. So you are saving lives with everything you do. So yes, you. you're it's welcome. So it's, okay. it's sort of, the film is sort of going to be my journey right. you know, I got from point A to point B, right. um, what I've learned and really hoping um, as we, as we travel through this journey is really helping uh, to educate not just, again, for, for me, is really getting uh, the ear of those in academia and giving them a sense of responsibility uh, that this is important enough that you need to change. You need to, uh, there's a lot of good things that we're doing in medicine, and this is not to point the finger at the field of medicine and say, you know, we're terrible. That's not what I'm saying. There's so many good things we, we've done that we can celebrate. We also have to shine the light on our ugly and this is one of our uglies. And so to um, let's put light on it and then let's in a really respectful way, come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a big ugly. I mean, people yeah. die from this. People I mean, die heart, from heart disease, our number one killer could be, uh, yes. yeah, it could just be wiped out. Yeah. So, so when are you going to have this film done or where are you in the production? Mm -hmm. The film is fully shot. We're now in post-production. Okay. And um, 
So we're editing, you know, music, graphics. Uh, we, we, we have a, a wonderful young uh, editor from New York City that's uh, just starting the process. This is huge. I mean, we have hundreds of, you know, hours of film that now have to be, you know, distilled down to whatever, I don't know, 90 minutes or 85 minutes, whatever it is that um, we're going to be distilling it down to. But it's a, it's a tremendous, we're looking at interviews, um, and, and you know, you, you know, you interview Colin Campbell for two hours, and you have to distill out uh, he, five minutes, ten minutes. Yeah, or no, <laughs> even less than that. I mean, <laughs> and, and that's hard to do. You're like, oh my god, that's important. That's important, but we can't put it all in. And mm. we've interviewed so many amazing people, and there's some people that are, we're, we're going to have to. And that's the hard part. That's why you know you need to bring in an outside person who can look at it and say, I know you love that piece and I know you're married, but you, you, we, we need to do this. And, and mm -hmm. th that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. because, um, every person that I ask to be part of this are people that I, that I um, respect and, and, and really wanted um, to give input on the film. And they can find it at codeblue. So the website is codebluedoc.com. So doc, if sort of documentary or doctor, it's a double entendre. Cool. And um, there you'll see a, a, a trailer. Uh, we made two trailers. The most recent one is, is there. And um, we, we hope that the film will be released in October. She actually wants to release it on the day that I was admitted to the hospital, which was October 11th. That was the day I, was, I first uh, learned of the diagnosis. It'll be 23. Um, October 11th, 2018 will be exactly uh, 23 years since my diagnosis. Wow. What an incredible journey the last 23 years. It has been an incredible journey. It's been um, uh, very enlightening and I feel so blessed to be where I am today. Yes. So now you're, oh, I'm sure, always open for donations. And so we should check that out. Is there a donation button there at that place? Or? There is. There is uh, to support us. But, uh, you yeah, know. Absolutely. Thank you. No, I'm saying everyone go, please. I know we've been trying. I've been, I encourage people to do that. Make that donation, even if it's a Thank small you. amount. Thank you for donating so generously. Oh, I wish I could have done more. That's when oh my, my life had to turn upside down <laughs> with the transition in Florida. There's some of these guys know of you know, the clinic closed, but now I'm doing, it's great. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the, every small amount adds up, right? So if you have a thousand five dollars, it's five thousand dollars. It goes a long way. So, mm -hmm. you know, if ten dollars, twenty dollars, a hundred dollars, what anyone can to do. But please, it's such an important project because it's not just about educating the public with this, right? You're really trying to reach into academia where we're we're going to be, you know, burgeoning new doctors. These young millennials or sometimes older. I was older when I went back <laughs> to medical school. That is the important factor, right? Because this has been my premise this whole time. Doctors are in a really unique place because right we're in that network that we have so much influence and people respect us. And right. we have we see so many people on a daily basis. And that person, you know, an influencer here or there, but that really needs to be the night of change. It needs to be doctors. We need to step out of our clinics and be leaders, right, in our society. Nice. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so it's so... Yeah, and, and, and it, by the way, it's by no fault of our own that we are where we are, right? But, I mean, the average physician, I mean, you and I are familiar with this because, you know, we've come to know this, and I came to know this because, obviously, listen, if I hadn't been diagnosed with MS, do you think I'd be, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. I'd probably, you know, I'd be back in New York City practicing infectious diseases. I, th this fell on me. I had no other choice. I mean, I always, I'm always amazed by people who do this that didn't. Uh, come into a problem that just found this and 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 did this of their own validity. I mean, I, I think that's amazing. But doctors don't know this, and I have so many wonderful friends who are great physicians, cardiologists, and gynecologists, and surgeons, and they just don't know. And um, and and so that we need to assure that the the folks that are teaching us, that are creating the curricula, implement this, and you know. To become a cardiologist, if you want to do a fellowship in cardiology, in order to meet the criteria to graduate from that fellowship, you have to complete 100 cardiac catheterizations, 100, right? But you do not have to sit for one nutrition course, not one, not an hour, not 15 minutes. You need, you need to show no proof that you know nothing about nutrition, yet we know that an optimal diet, physical lifestyle, 
could prevent 80% of heart disease. Wow. That is it all, doesn't it? It's, it's incredible. incredible. Yeah, absolutely. I don't even, I agree 100%, Sarai, you're absolutely right. And there are so many people I think that are going to benefit just from listening to this, but I can't wait to see this documentary. And where are you, where are you hoping to share it or, you know, when you first do the open night? Uh, well, we're going to, our premiere will be, we're in New York, so, um, the, our director, so New York City will be the premiere, and um, then we hope to go all over the country and, and do premieres. We have, I think we have a couple set up, one in, in Colorado, actually, in Philadelphia. Um, maybe we'll go to... Uh, Seattle? You yeah. bet. Yeah, well, yeah. We can do that. I, I can, I can work on it. You, we'll talk offline. You let me know what you need, and I, I will approach anyone. As you know. And, 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 <laughs> thank you. And the executive director, our extraordinary executive director of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Susan Benigas, has so nicely invited us to premiere the film at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine conference next year in Indianapolis. So we're, we're excited about that. And this year? This coming right? year? Yes. Yeah. New we're already in 2018. <laughs> That's in October, right? Or is yes. it September? At the October. end of October. Yeah. Wow, cool. Oh, I will. I am, I will definitely hope to be there. Yes. I, yes. <laughs> There's so much going on. There's so much going on right now. So I am, yeah, yes, literally. Yes. But anyway, so that is incredible. I mean, you're just an amazing person and I'm just so happy and thankful that you find, we finally yeah. found time. We've been working on this for how many months? At least three, four. <laughs> it's terrible. And this is, this is unacceptable. No, Again. you, but you're, you're busy still raising your little ones. Oh yes. Can I just, I know you have just a few minutes left. Your little ones. So your kiddos are how old, if you don't mind? Well, they're not that little. They're 14 and 17. Oh, wow. So during this time, they got to see you get well, but maybe they don't remember you being sick. Uh, yeah, no, I think. Um, remember some? My, my older, my son probably remembers a little bit better. Uh, yeah, but they, they know. They've, they've seen it. They've seen it happening in real time. And, um, and by the way, it, it, I should say this to be clear. It's not been perfect. Um, I never say that I'm, that I cured of MS. Uh, I, I live with MS mm -hmm. and if I decided tomorrow that I was going to sit on the couch and I was just going to eat cheeseburgers and not do anything. I, I can tell you within a couple of weeks, I'd be back, you know, in a bad place. So I don't mess around. I can tell you that there are times when like lat for the past 18 months, we were running crazy filming all over the country and I wasn't sleeping enough and, um, even at ACLM, uh, this past year I spoke at ACLM and uh, it was sort of crazy. Tra we had just done a trip and then ACLM and um, one of the nights I, uh, that I, I wanted to go to the dinner banquet, they were honoring With Dr. Esselstyn. Mm -hmm. Dr. Esselstyn is somebody who I just so highly respect and, and just adore. He and his family are just amazing. And I didn't go to that banquet because I knew that I needed to sleep. I needed to take time to rest. And that, I, I was heartbroken about that because I really wanted to be there. But there are times where I have to make decisions and it's always, and here's the other thing uh, that's important for all of us. You have to put yourself first, even mm -hmm. as mothers and as caretakers, we're always, uh, and as physicians, it's, you know, we're sort of built on this premise that we must take care of the world. And then we forget to take care of ourselves. Um, you have to put yourself first. Mm -hmm. uh, above all else and and that's not selfish it's a gift that you're mm -hmm. giving everyone you love because if you don't do that uh then uh it's not in your best interest so right. always put yourself first so i think that's a great ending take care of ourselves so we can take care of the ones we love absolutely self-care is self-care <laughs> self-care is self-care you know what that's gonna be the title self-care is health care all right well, thank you once again, Dr. Standick, in your incredible journey and sharing your story and codeblue.doc.com. And I'll put the links in everyone. Please, please, please go and support Dr. Standick as she shares this very important message. Thank you thank so you. much, Brian. So much fun talking to you. Me too.